Well, if we could start finding our seats and getting ready to, uh, to get started this morning. Good to see everybody. Uh, good to see everybody this morning. How are we doing with the live stream, Ethan? Everything looking good there? Good morning, live stream. Good to have you with us. We're glad that, uh, that you can be joining us today. We have a little bit of a smaller group today. We have a lot of folks who are uh, traveling today, do, getting some last summer, uh, summer events in and so forth. So a little bit smaller group here with us this morning, but uh, we're thankful for uh, everybody who is here and for live stream as well. So Let's, uh, let's go ahead and get ready for, uh, for our time of worship today. I don't have any announcements this morning, um, but as I've been saying, they're coming. They're on the way. So I uh, just want to keep getting us ready for the fact that uh, here in the coming weeks, we're going to have uh, quite a bit of stuff headed our way. So, yeah. If you if you borrow a mask, uh, we have a a Tupperware tub up here. Just place it uh, right in there. Live stream. You don't have to bring your mask in. Uh, it's it's fun. Uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, so if you for if you're here, if you borrow one, we have some there to borrow. Just put it in um, in the tub up here before you take or off. Take so or take. Yeah. Chrissy says to take it home with you if you. <laughs> if you need it as well. So, um, all right. Well, let me uh, let me pray for us, and uh, then the music team will come up, and we'll uh, we'll start with worship. So, uh, join me in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. It's a beautiful uh, beautiful day, and I'm thankful for it. Uh, Father, uh, be here with us. Help us as we worship. Uh, may we be blessed. May you be glorified. Um, Father, uh, go before us and, and lead us to where you want us to be today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Worship team.
guys pray with me real quick? Heavenly Father, we just come before you um, just as children who long to be in your presence. Lord, thank you for the promises that you give to us through scripture, um, you know, telling us over and over again how Jesus is the cornerstone on which we are supposed to build our lives, Lord, that he is the greatest anchor, um, the only anchor, really, that can sustain us um, and protect us even in all seasons um, of joy and of weather. Lord, I pray that um, that uh, that principle, that lesson would really just anchor itself in our hearts this morning. Worshiping together as we do. I don't know. <laughs> Just such a joy to be together. Yeah. Awesome. This last song we're going to sing is called King of My Heart. Um, this is actually one of my favorite meditative songs. Um, I know it's probably not the way you say that word, um, but I just glory and revel. Um, just in the fact that, you know, <laughs> the king of my heart is just where my heart wants to be, where my heart wants to, you know, make camp and like rise, be in the morning and in the afternoon and at night. Um, I just hope it's as much of a blessing for you. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. 
Amen. Brothers and sisters, you may be seated. The, uh, the worship team this morning had a bit of a wrestling match with these songs uh, this morning. It was one of those days where just every, nothing was going very easy. Uh, can we show the worship team some love because um, they put in a lot of work and um, the paycheck is not great. Uh, just, just be real honest with you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Olivia, I'll talk with you about that later. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, our scripture reading this morning is Philippians chapter 2. We're going to hear part of this twice this morning, once now, and then we're going to hear a larger section of it a little bit later on. But I'm going to go ahead and take the time to uh, read the first 11 verses of chapter 2. This is... A, um, an incredible, incredible passage. And so let's, let's, uh, let's hear it uh, this morning. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I am <clears throat> thankful that, that you know us, that we can sing, that you are a good, good Father. Uh, Father, we are still in trying and difficult days, and even though there is good news and beauty and wonderful things that are happening, uh, there, are, there are many sad things that continue to go on, and it seems to be uh, taking its toll uh, on, on many of us. And um, so, Father, help us, help us to rest in you. Help us to, uh, to believe your word, to, to believe these truths that Jesus is our anchor. Uh, help us to not try to, try to anchor ourselves in any other way, but only, only through your son, Jesus. Uh, Father, we... Just pray for um, those from our body specifically who are dealing with uh, tiredness, stress, uh, difficulty. Um, there's, there's a lot of things that have started up these last couple of weeks, and over the next several weeks, there's going to be a lot of things that, that affect us as a church. And uh, So, Father, help us, help us to be looking to you and trusting in you and finding our, our strength in you. Help us to uh, just keep... Keep walking, keep putting one foot in front of the other as we follow faithfully after you. Um, Lord, uh, I'm, I'm glad and I'm, I'm thankful, even, uh, even on these summer Sundays when things are kind of crazy and difficult at times, we just have the gift and the beauty of music that we can sing together and, and be together. Um, it's a gift, Father. Help us not to... Uh, not to overlook the gift. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
All right, we, uh, we do have some children here today, so let's celebrate the children real quick. Uh, we do have a few that are off uh, visiting some family, doing some different things, so we eagerly um, look forward to their return in the coming weeks. Um, I do want to say this, though. Our word for the day is not only for the children. It is for us as well. The word for the day is obedience. Yes, you can groan as loudly as you want. Uh, that's our word for the day, obedience. And so uh, that's going to be our focus. So uh, for the, the parents here and uh, parents, guardians here, live stream, uh, the adults in the room, you, you got to listen in to this as well, right? This is not, uh, this is for everybody, it's for all of us. Uh, so in a book I uh, recently read, the author described a person that they knew as fluent in French and silence. <laughs> fluent in French and silence, and I really liked that. And it made me think about our focus on humility last week and our focus on obedience this week. And so here was my thought, that as Christians, we need to be fluent in humility and obedience. Uh, these are two languages that hopefully we can be fluent with. Obedience is an interesting word. I find it to be very, uh, very interesting. We seem to have a love-hate relationship with this word and concept. Uh, right? There's times where we absolutely love and appreciate obedience, and there's times where our rebellious nature kind of will creep up, and we don't want to have anything to do with it. As far as I'm concerned, it seems we tend to hate it when it is required of us, right? We don't like obedience when it, when it is required of us, but tend to love it when it is owed us, Right? If it's required of me, I don't want to have anything to do with it. If I get to say, obey me, then yeah, I'm, all, I'm fine with obedience, right? We will not be able to get away from obedience in this life uh, and, and for all of eternity, I think. So this is something that we really have to, have to wrestle with. As a child, I remember uh, I have these vivid memories of uh, being with these groups of adults, and the adults uh, just chuckling with delight over the rebellious young man who proudly declared in a fit of anger that he was joining the military because he was tired of his parents and everyone else telling him what to do. <laughs> All right, so he was going to go and he was going to join the military. Or he, nobody was going to tell him anything to do, right? And the, <laughs> it was just, just laughter at, at the thought of that. Right? Obedience is a virtue held in high regard by both saint and mob boss. <laughs> Obedience is a virtue expected by both parent and child. Eat your dinner. I'm still hungry. Obedience is a virtue demanded by both employer and employee. These are the expectations of the job. Your workplace is broken and better get fixed. Uh, it was in the news just recently over this past week with baseball. Baseball has all kinds of rules on the books, if you're familiar with, uh, with baseball at all. There's all kinds of rules. And then there's a whole series of unwritten rules that the players and teams need to be aware of as well. And one of the stories that broke was that uh, one of the players dared to break one of the unwritten rules of baseball. They take this very seriously. Brawls will break out if somebody breaks an unwritten rule, right? Uh, if you break it, it there's going to be, be consequences, uh, right? And doesn't that seem true with obedience as well? There are rules that are written down, but then there are all sorts of unwritten understandings towards obedience. There's all these kind of things that we just maybe kind of know that aren't written down anywhere, but we just know them, and it's something that we're supposed to be obedient <laughs> towards, be aware of, right? It seems to me that either with God or without God, we expect obedience, because we are essentially saying that obedience means life and well-being. 
Obedience is essentially saying, if you follow these things, that you will have life and well-being. And that's why I say uh, obedience is held in high regard by both saint and mob boss. Because what does the mob boss essentially say? If you obey, you will have life and, and well-being. Things will go fine. But if you do not obey, well, thank you, Tutu. Things will go badly, right? We will obey. The question is, in which direction? We will obey, but which direction? I want to read a few sentences from Christian Wyman. He's a poet I've been referencing uh, over this summer a few times. If you're not familiar with Christian Wyman, uh, he, has, he has this very specific way with words. Uh, I can't really describe it, but you may get a little sense of it as I, as I read this. Um, but I think he's really onto something with this thought. So let me, let me read these few sentences for us. This is Christian Wyman. I don't really believe in atheists, nor in true believers for that matter. One either lives toward God or not. The word God is, of course, an abyss, bright or dark, depending on the day. But there is no middle ground, no cautious agnosticism in which to settle. No spiritual indifference that is not, even when accompanied by high refinement and exquisite intelligence, torpor. I know the necessity of religion. I know we need communal ritual and meaningful creeds. And yet I know, too, that all of this emerges from an intuition so original that in some ultimate sense, to define is to defile. One either lives toward God or not. One either lives toward God or not. And I, I, really, uh, I really appreciate his thought there and um, living towards God or not. I, I agree with, with that sentiment. Does that resonate with you at all? We will obey, I think, and just to put a couple of, of pictures to it, we will obey when we are really scared or when we really want the prize awaiting us at the end of something. If we have some sort of, uh, of medical emergency that can move us into scared obedience in the sense of the doctor comes along and says, this is what you need to do in order to continue to live. And all of a sudden your life is, is there before you. I, I'm going to obey. Uh, I never obeyed the doctors before, but this time I definitely will because I am so scared of what I'm seeing and sensing. And so, yes, I will obey. Scared obedience. Uh, one instance can be from some sort of medical emergency. Prize obedience. I will obey in order to get the prize at the end of whatever the event was. When, uh, when I was... A teenager, it was time uh, to get my driver's license. In West Virginia at the time, I don't know what it is now, but when I was there, you could get a learner's permit when you turned 15 and then uh, get your license when you turned 16. I waited until I turned 16 to get my learner's permit. I only had to have it for like two months, and then I could go and take my driving, driver's test. It doesn't make any sense to me when I think of it now, <laughs> right? but that's, that's what I did. So I went to the DMV. Took the, took the written test. Now it was time for the driving test, right? So I get in the car with the instructor. You have to do the parallel parking, all that kind of stuff. And he says, all right, well, let's, let's take the car out for, for a little, little ride around town, see how you do. So best behavior, right? <laughs> and I take it out, and I go to where he directs me and say, all right, great, turn around, and let's, let's start heading back. In heading back after I turned around, I got into a turn lane instead of staying in the lane to go straight to head back towards the DMV. And so there were cars everywhere all of a sudden. I'm stuck in this turn lane, and now I'm really nervous, right? Because I'm suddenly going to be heading in a direction that I didn't want to be heading in. So he looks at me and says, uh, hey, so, uh, so what do you think? You think you can just, just get over in that other lane real quick and, and go straight? And now I'm really, does he want me to do this or not? Right? Is this a, is this a test? What, what's, he, what's he up to here, right? And so I'm kind of looking around, I'm like, no, I don't think so. 
Okay, great. Yeah, let's just turn, and then we'll go this back way through some parking lots. We'll get back. Okay, absolutely. Yes, sir, I will do that, right? I followed his every direction perfectly. Why? I wanted the prize at the end, right? Imagine the difference if I had said, when he told me, yeah, why don't we go over here? And I said, no. I want to go over there. I'm going, I'm, I'm going to drive wherever I want to drive. There's a good chance I wouldn't have received my driver's license at the end of that event, right? Prize obedience. Here's the prize at the end of this thing. If you do really well, I'll do, I'll do whatever it takes to get that thing, right? If we encase our obedience and life towards God from fear, as in he's coming for me fear, I'm terrified fear, or from a prize at the end mentality, as in heaven is an award ceremony, then we will misunderstand God and our existence here. I'm scared, as in terrified, of who God is. I'll, I'll obey just to, just to try to make sure that I'm okay. Or I'm going to obey to try and get that prize at the end. Either one of those options, those paths, those directions, I think, actually leads us away from God and not closer to God. I firmly believe this, and I hope, it's, I hope I'm right about this, that heaven is not an award ceremony. I think that's really good news for us. I think we will have a chance of being on the right path of living our lives toward God if we bathe our obedience in the beauty of God. I will obey because you are beautiful. I love you. You love me. You are a good, good father. I will because I just want to be with you. Who you are. I recognize who you are as, as much as I possibly can. Why would I go anywhere else? Why would I do anything else? Of course, I will obey. Obedience is not a stodgy plodding in the ruts of religion. It is a hopeful race toward God's promises. I didn't write that. That was a quote. I've got to be honest. Obedience is not a stodgy plodding in the ruts of religion. It is a hopeful race toward God's promises. This requires, I think, an attuned sense of hearing. If we are not careful, we can turn our hearing into a mechanical machine instead of the necessary flesh and blood living hearing that it is going to require. Uh, I'm going to give an illustration now, and um, there's a good chance that Ben will disagree with me. So if he starts doing all kinds of things back there, it's just that that's his protest, right? He's not, he's not very happy with me. Mechanical hearing, I think, can, we can think of it like a microphone. Now, we have microphones all over this room all of a sudden, right? We are swimming in microphones. They're everywhere. There's probably going to be more added in the coming weeks, right? We just got them all over the place. When I first started here, we barely had one. Right? Maybe like the second one didn't even work all the time. Right? So we basically only have one microphone. Now I don't even know how many. They're, they're all over the place. They're fantastic. We need them. I'm thankful for them. But microphones here, right? They're listening. Microphones are hearing, they are listening, but a microphone is not capable of laughter, tears, relationships, love. They might cause us tears, <laughs> right? But I cannot have a relationship with this microphone like I can with my family, right? 
mechanical hearing is going to take in the sound and amplify it. But that's it. The machine will hear and give out, but there's nothing else with it. That's it. Flesh and blood living hearing is capable, though, of laughter, tears, relationship, love, right? If, if you were all uh, machines that were just programmed to laugh when I told one of my great jokes, right? It would be done. <laughs> As you see the laughter, it gets me, right? It's like, yeah, yes. Okay, why? Because we have this human to human beautiful relationship together. I don't have that with the microphones. If we turn everything into this machine-like existence, we're losing significance. We're losing something important. We're losing what God is trying to do with us. We're about to read Psalm 132, but I want, to, uh, I want us to take a few uh, minutes to hear a few sentences to take with us into this psalm. So if you want to start looking for it, uh, Psalm 132, I'm going to read a few sentences from my reading this week. Try to hold on. It, it's a little bit lengthy. You won't be able to hold on to all of it, but try to find something to hold on to and then take with us into Psalm 132. Psalm 132 cultivates a hope that gives wings to obedience, a hope that is consistent with the reality of what God has done in the past but is not confined to it. All the expectations listed in Psalm 132 have their origin in an accurately remembered past. But they are not simply repetitions of the past projected into the future. They are developments out of it with new features of their own. Christians who master Psalm 132 will be protected from one danger, at least, that is ever a threat to obedience. The danger that we should reduce Christian existence to ritually obeying a few commandments that are congenial to our temperament and convenient to our standard of living. It gives us instead a vision into the future so that we can see what is right before us. If we define the nature of our lives by the mistake of the moment or the defeat of the hour or the boredom of the day, we will define it wrongly. We need roots in the past to give obedience direction and goal, and they must be connected. There must be an organic unity between them. Psalm 132. Remember, O Lord, in David's favor, all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it in Epaphra. We found it in the fields of Jar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your saints shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my covenants and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. Poor, uh, as usual, we're not 
we're not covering everything. We're not looking at everything. There's very little, actually, that we're going to be pulling from this. What is, what is this? This is a psalm. It is poetry. And poetry requires another reading. Poetry requires another reading. If you would say and ask, I have read it several times. How many readings does it require? I would answer, another one. Right? And if you came back again, well, okay, I've read it again. How, how many more times? Another one. It would, bless you. It would never end. Every time you would say, I've, I've read it, do I have to do it again? Yes. <laughs> read again and again and again and again. This is true for poetry. This is true for Scripture, for all of Scripture. It requires another reading. And so on your own, if you can, please, I, I invite you to this every week. Spend more time with these portions of Scripture. Give them another reading because that's where the depth is going to, is going to come from. Uh, if, if we can treat Scripture and, and the life of faith like Hank Vergona treated his art, then I think we'll be doing well. Does anybody know who Hank Vergona is? He was an artist, uh, and I just recently watched a fascinating documentary about him. The documentary was made when he was in his late 80s. He has passed away since, uh, since then, but he was, he was this artist living in New York City, and he had a studio right in the city, but he lived about a, an hour away. Six days a week, he would travel an hour by walking and train to get to his studio. And then at the end of the day, he would travel the hour back. And at this point, he had suffered uh, a lot of medical situations. He had slowed down a lot. And uh, they were filming him as he was walking back to his home. And he was just, just moving along slowly. He said, you know, I used to be able to go much faster than this. But, but now it, it just takes me this, this longer time. And they were just kind of walking through in the documentary of, like, why? Why does he do this? Why does he keep going to the studio six days a week when he's in his late 80s? He's gone through all of this stuff to do his art. And, and they were asking him about this. And he was, I, I just, I have to do it. I have to do my art. And this, this is the key. He would say this. I'm, I'm discovering something. I, I'm just, I'm discovering something. And I got I to gotta figure out where it goes. I got, I got to chase this down. He's in his late 80s. He's been a professional artist since he was in his 20s. I'm discovering something. And I'm so, I'm so excited about it. I, I have to do this. I have to chase this down. At one point in the documentary, they were interviewing him, and he said, yeah, you know, I, I had to make a decision of whether I was going to sign another lease for the studio for two more years. He said, you know, it, if I make it, I'll be, I'll be in my 90s. But I had to sign it <laughs> because he had to have that so that he could keep chasing those discoveries. What if us with Scripture, no matter how long we've been with God, no matter how long we've read Scripture, we're sitting there saying, I'm discovering something. I'm discovering something. I've got to chase it. I've got I to see where it takes me. I want it. I want this. I was inspired by Hank, and even though you haven't seen the documentary, I hope he inspires you as well. What are we discovering? Are we chasing it? A story referenced as a cautionary tale and a truth to live with. This is how we will close. I'm not going to read the story for us. I'm going to summarize it, and then if you, uh, if you want to go and read it later on, uh, that is, of course, highly encouraged, uh, right? Second Samuel chapter 6, we are told a story, a confounding story, a confusing story, a kind of difficult story uh, that, that at first reading, it just doesn't seem to make sense. But then with further study, it begins to, to come into clearer focus. The Philistines had taken the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was this golden box that belonged to Israel. It was to remind them of God's presence with them. It was really important for them. The Philistines were their enemies, and they took it, they stole it, and, but things didn't go well for them in this. And so they're like, we got to get rid of this thing, right? 
So David, King David, ends up getting the Ark of the Covenant back. So he sends two guys, Uzzah and Ahio, to go and retrieve the Ark of the Covenant and to bring it back to Jerusalem. So they go and they take a brand new ox cart and they get the Ark of the Covenant up onto the brand new ox cart and they begin moving back towards Jerusalem. And there's great excitement. There's great uh, celebration that is taking place. And then at one point, as the ox are moving along, it hits into a little rut and the ox uh, cart tips. The Ark of the Covenant is about to fall. Uzzah sticks out his hand to keep the Ark of the Covenant from falling to the ground. He's protecting it. He's trying to help. Doesn't it seem like that's a good thing to do? And as he touches it, he drops dead. He drops dead. What is going on? David is furious. What is happening, God? We are doing what you've told us to do. We're, we're doing your work. We're, we're bringing your presence back into Jerusalem. And, and you, you kill this man. And he was furious. We're, just stop everything. They stopped and uh, they let this family keep the Ark of the Covenant for a while. And they were tremendously blessed, which seems strange. Like, what, what, what is going on here? And David comes back and figures out what's going on to some degree. Why? Why? Reaching out to touch it, to keep it from falling. I'm doing, doing God's work. Drops dead. Why? Because they had forgotten. And they were doing things in their own way. Because the Ark of the Covenant was not supposed to be on an ox cart. It was to be carried by the priests. We worked through this a while back. I don't know if anybody would remember that or not. Here's what I think was going on. I think God was stopping them before they got into the city by their own means. By Uzzah dying because of his action, it was a, whoa, hold on. Something isn't right here. Imagine the difference if they had gotten into the city with the Ark of the Covenant by their own means in their own way. They thought they were being obedient. And instead, they were following their own path. God stops them. It's a cautionary tale. The Ark of the Covenant was not a magical talisman to leverage God's power for the benefit of the possessor. That's what the Philistines thought. This is a war treasure. We're going to take it. It's going to be fantastic. We'll leverage the gods of, the, of Israel for our purposes and so forth. And they learned a terrible lesson. The Ark of the Covenant was not a magical talisman to leverage God's power for the benefit of the, of the possessor. Neither is obedience. Neither is obedience few sentences from my reading. The history of the Ark was, for the Hebrews, a kind of theological handbook. It provided an account of the presence of God among the people. Its history showed the importance of having God with you and the danger of trying to use God or carry him around. And so the Ark itself was important in that it emphasized that God was with his people and that God was over and above his people, for God quite obviously was not in the box. The ark was the symbol, not the reality. When the ark was treated as a talisman or as a magical device with which to manipulate God, everything went wrong. God cannot be contained or used. That's a story of a cautionary tale. The truth to live with. Jesus Christ is our hope and greatest example of a life lived with humility and obedience. Philippians, we're going to hear a longer section from this. We're not going to dig into this today. That's not my purposes. My purposes is more for us to hear it and to invite you to spend time with it on your own. Give it another reading, another reading, another reading. We're going to back up into chapter 1 and start at the end of verse 18 and then read a little bit further than we did earlier into chapter 2. 
listen to this closely, read this closely, and, and then if you can find some time for some further study and, and just slowing down with it a little bit more than what we are here today, I think, I think you will be blessed by it. So Philippians chapter 1, end of verse 18. This is Paul writing to the audience, a group of people he knew well in Philippi. Yes, and I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. There's a lot there, isn't there, friends? But that's important. Uh, someone has said that, uh, that this passage is, is one of the mountaintop uh, portions of Scripture. It is, it is beautiful and, and wonderful, and it's, it's one of those that I circle back around to again and again and again. Um, it takes another reading, <laughs> another reading, another reading. Obedience moving toward more for ourselves will end in disaster. Obedience moving toward more for ourselves will end in disaster. Obedience from love and a desire for the glory of God to be known more will get us where we need to be. I think obedience says... I deem you worthy 
and worthwhile. I deem you worthy and worthwhile. Here's, here's my closing thought. By grace, by grace, God finds us worthwhile. Is he worthwhile to us? Pray with me, please. Father, may it be, may it be. Help us as we live to live toward you. We cannot do it on our own, and what a beautiful truth and promise we have of the Holy Spirit here with us. Attune us to the Spirit, your Holy Spirit, so that we will live lives in obedience to you, not out of terrified fear of what you may do to us, but out of reverent fear of why would we obey anyone else? Thank you for loving us. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your grace that covers us. You are Father. You are Lord. You are good. You are God alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand, put on your mask, and join us in song.
We'll end with um, some scripture from Romans. Romans 15, verse 13. It says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Thank you for joining us this morning.